My name is Duke Ryder. I am the executive director of the Ten Across Initiative at Arizona State University and welcome everyone, panelists and audience. For those of you who don't know, Future Tense is a partnership of Slate, New America and Arizona State University that explores emerging technologies and their impact on society. I'd like to thank my colleague, Andres Martinez, Future Tense's editorial director for allowing us to leverage this platform for today's conversation. Um, this event is also another kind of partnership. It involves New America's resource security program and the Ten Across Initiative. And I've enjoyed my relationship with Sharon Burke, who heads up that program, and Wyatt Scott. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to work with them, and we have conducted interviews with folks in cities across the I-10 geography that's part of our project. And everyone has made extraordinary uh, contributions to what we've understood about the role of government, climate change, et cetera. For those of you who uh, may not know much about uh, the security program and its interest in the large scale understanding of what security means, it's not surprising they would look at climate change. And as Sharon and Wyatt see climate change, it involves, of course, environmental issues, transportation issues, uh, but also equity and fairness, energy, water, land, you name it. They called on us because they knew we were looking at an area that we have described being on the front lines of environmental, economic, and social change. And if you look at the 10 across quarter running from Los Angeles, and we're delighted to have Mayor Villaraigosa with us today, uh, all the way to Jacksonville, we believe that all the issues of our time are shown in their highest relief in this quarter. So this coming together of these two, two organizations and their common interests made perfect sense. The structure of today's session is that I'm gonna ask each of our five panelists, and I understand that's quite a few, to put some issues on the table. Uh, the second half of the session will probably be more conversational. Uh, you'll be invited to sort of a dinner party with the six of us. And we'll be inviting questions from the audience and I'll be able to see those. And if I see one that really seems relevant to something that was just said by one of our panelists, I'll try to weave that in. Quickly, a very short introductions because I want the panelists really to do uh, some self-introducing shortly. We have, of course, Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa uh, with us. He's the 41st mayor uh, of Los Angeles, but of course, a lot more than that, as you will hear. Abena, uh, excuse me, uh, Abena Ajitayo, uh, who's the Director of Housing and Community Resilience in Tallahassee, Florida, another town across city. Abram Lusgarden, the author and senior reporter for ProPublica. Nicole Farini, the Chief Resilience Officer and Director of Community and Human Development in the city of El Paso. And uh, last but not least, Van Newkirk, uh, New America 11th Hour Fellow and Senior Editor of The Atlantic. And if you look at this cross-section of people, it's an interesting mix of those who write and observe uh, and with uh, really close attention to detail. And also those who are on the front lines of actually doing things in these cities. So I wanna start with Van. Uh, who, if you have not heard his Floodlines podcast, really should. Uh, he and I have a common shared interest in Hurricane Katrina and its aftermath uh, and how it uh, government and a variety of situations really impacted individual lives. And it comes through vividly in his podcast. So Van, I'd like to turn over to you to describe that project and your interest in those kinds of situations. Okay, well, I think um, I'll start with the uh, interest because I think it helps explain the podcast. Uh, for years, I was a reporter um, doing mostly uh, work on climate change, on environmental justice, on the ways that government uh, failed or helped people in times of disaster and need, uh, and the ways that all those things sort of uh, mesh together with inequality in our existing social issues in America. Um, so after I'd come back from uh, doing that type of reporting in Puerto Rico after uh, Hurricane Maria, it really became clear that uh, one way to, to really take a big bite at this and get people's eyes on environmental injustice, on the intersection of inequality, government, and disaster was to go and talk about Hurricane Katrina, which uh, was a big national turning point on all those issues. Now, so Floodlines um, is our, is the Atlantic's first narrative podcast it was our effort at understanding exactly what happened in that disaster, not just a hurricane, but the levees breaking. Those are, you know, nationally 
uh, built and funded levees uh, by the Army Corps of Engineers. And what happened in the aftermath to people who were there, who lived through it, um, who were forced uh, across the country, and many who came back to New Orleans and the surrounding areas and found that maybe their homes weren't destroyed, but then they got caught up in uh, a round of development and redevelopment and rebuilding that didn't include all the people. Uh, so Floodlines is an eight-part podcast that follows people uh, who went through it on multiple different levels. Uh, and, and we end with uh, a, a long conversation with uh, former director of FEMA, Michael Brown. Um, and we talk about all the different ways uh, the levels of government failed, who it failed, and how it kind of reinforced the existing uh, policy failures in America to protect poor people, people of color, uh, people who live in certain housing and cities, uh, and how disasters are not necessarily things that come out of nowhere, but more so punctuation marks at the end of sentences. And those sentences are a long history of policy in America. And, and if you uh, haven't heard uh, Dan's interview with Michael Brown, who's famous for the, you're doing a, a, an incredible job, Brownie, uh, by the former president, um, it's stunning. And if there it was ever an intersection of government being discussed and its role and responsibility and the expectations of the public to serve uh, people in need, uh, especially at a time of need like that, uh, it's powerful. And I think you drew some things out of him that no one else has. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I hope others get a chance to listen to that and we'll come back to the role of government. Uh, Nicole, I'd like to turn to you, uh, and it's great to see you uh, as a slightly late arrival, but we're delighted to have you. Um, and, and obviously, you are actively engaged in the life of a city, in this case, a binational city, really, between El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. And uh, you may not have had your uh, Katrina, but you've had plenty of things to deal with. Uh, you had a terrible uh, mass shooting last year. You're occasionally the flashpoint for discussions about immigration. And unfortunately, uh, I, I see your city on the television a lot with regard to how COVID is, COVID, uh, COVID is impacting you. So um, your definitions of resilience surely have expanded in the course of your tenure. And I think they're even reflected in uh, your job title. And I think that's true of Abena as well. Tell us uh, about your role, what you're doing there and uh, how government uh, is, is uh, doing its level best to ameliorate under these situations. Yeah, absolutely, Duke, and, and thank you for having me, and, and thank you um, to the whole 10 Across team for always being such great partners to the city of El Paso. I'm always privileged to be part of this fantastic network, and so just to do a little bit of an introduction, what I'll say when I start to speak about networks, um, I think that uh, my time with the city of El Paso really began uh, as we became part of the 100 Resilient Cities Network uh, back in 2013. Uh, I became the city's first chief resilience officer in December of 2014. So actually it's interesting, today is my six year anniversary with the city of El Paso um, and, and doing this work, which I think for all of us that have been in this space and dealing with all of these challenges, that feels like about 600 years uh, instead of just six. Um, but what's interesting is that as I came on board as resilience officer, I think there was a lot of emphasis around environment. We, I think we thought that we were just gonna be dealing with water and heat and it was gonna be a purely you know, boxed in environmental issue. And what we really learned uh, to your point was an evolving definition of what resilience was gonna mean for the city of El Paso. And so my work in the realm of climate change, uh, especially in the context of resilience practice really begins and ends with people. El Paso's greatest asset has always been, is today, and will always be her people, right? And our people are multicultural, we're binational. Uh, we are the largest binational, bicultural, bilingual metroplex in the world. Uh, and that's something that folks don't know about us. I think they tend to think about a dusty West Texas city. Um, but uh, as such, the, the, the conversation and resulting policy, uh, whether it be urban heat or air quality, water, or energy, uh, is really driven by its impact on people. It's very easy to get wrapped up in the technical aspects of our work uh, and forget really why we're doing it, right? So we start to talk about, well, maybe we should create more shade so we can address urban heat, but well, why? 
it's really because of the people that live there. And so understanding uh, equity and inclusivity at a really deep level and not just a superficial level um, is really, really important. We have to constantly ask ourselves, I think, three big questions. How do our actions change people's lives? Uh, are they focused on deep long-term results for community? Or are we, what I, are we doing what I call hashtag solutions uh, that are basically only an inch deep, right? Um, and then finally, uh, are we giving our people and the communities that we're living in, um, first of all, do we really understand who that is? Uh, and second, are we giving them the tools they need to really drive this journey uh, right alongside us? And so uh, I'll just end by saying that this entire journey for us in terms of re what resilience means for El Paso uh, is about embedding equity and inclusivity as a foundational pillar. Um, climate is one of those pieces, um, but as you've heard me say, uh, Duke, on many, many occasions, um, resilience, sustainability, equity, these are not siloed concepts. These are inextricably linked uh, from family, right? Um, and so I really think that uh, I'm, I'm, ex I'm excited that we're starting to see that discussion uh, more broadly uh, across cities in government. We're hearing the words spoken, um, but what I'm really hoping is that that discussion uh, really translates into action that's meaningful for people. And in that space, I think we'll really start to see progress in terms of the things that are really important to our society. I, th I think you're going to hear those uh, notions echoed by all of the panelists, uh, and, and I look forward to following up on that when we get back to you in the second round here. So thank you for that, Nicole. Uh, Abram, uh, I, I want to turn to you, uh, and it, for those of you who don't know uh, about, uh, and you should, uh, Abram's recent uh, cover articles in New York Times Magazine about uh, the role that climate change is playing on issues of migration and various populations, whether they're in this country or internationally, having to move elsewhere because of issues related to heat or it could be later because of water and other things, they're extraordinary. Uh, so I'd love, Abram, to explain how you got to this point of, of writing these essays, what came out of them, what you learned in the process, and how it might relate to especially practitioners like Nicole and Abana and, and the mayor who are in cities. What do you think the, the effect of your work can be on their situations? Yeah, thank you, Duke. And it's fantastic to be a part of this group again. Uh, really an honor to be among the rest of you in this conversation. Um, so uh, just to back up the the, the articles that, that Duke mentioned, it began with a realization uh, that one of the most uh, dynamic and impactful effects of climate change globally is going to be this movement of great populations. And so uh, the first article in this series looked at that movement of uh, migrants uh, globally, uh, looking at, a, at a, uh, approximately a billion to three billion people that should be displaced or are likely to find themselves outside of sort of the ideal climate niche uh, around the world and beginning to consider what the implications are for the movement of such a large number of people uh, towards the American border into Europe, uh, perhaps uh, moving north from South Asia on the Asian continent as well. And uh, the second part in the series is really an examination of what that means for the United States. And the United States is not uh, going to be as um, impacted as, say, Guatemala or uh, North Africa in terms of the physical effects of climate change, but it is going to be severely affected. And so when we look at the displacement of um, of populations, not just from uh, storms and catastrophes like Hurricane Katrina, uh, but the slow onset displacement of coping with the economic change and the food insecurity that comes with rising heat or increasing floods and so forth, um, we begin to see a picture of the United States that could be uh, dramatically transformed. And so um, just from a data perspective, uh, some of the numbers that we crunch looking at the United States suggest that about 160 million Americans or about half of the country uh, will again find themselves outside of this, this kind of climate niche. And that's a, that's a niche that's defined by uh, researchers who recently published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences kind of identifying the ideal temperature zone for and precipitation zone for life on this planet. Um, of those, we, uh, we tried to uh, zero in on what the particular threats are and to map those threats across the country. And we often talk about threats of fire, wildfire, or heat. 
um, as specific things in specific places. But what we uh, really could see is that if you look at wildfires across the West and extreme heat across the South and a decline in crop yields across the Midwest uh, and the encroachment of sea level rise on the coast and particularly on the Gulf Coast in the Southeast, that when you look at all of these together, you begin to see a United States with the walls closing in that's going to affect um, at least 10 to 15 million people, more on the order, most likely, though it's difficult to estimate, of you know 80 to 100 million Americans. So you know, again, between uh, a quarter and a half of the country uh, can expect to be severely physically impacted by the states they live in. Um, uh, you know, possible and, and make them uh, the things that they are today. So the, the project uh, and part of the second story and part of the ongoing work is to consider, you know, what that what that means, um, you know, sort of a new way of looking at the, the you know, the quote unquote disaster of, of climate change. And, you know, I, it's been a difficult conversation, but we're at an interesting turning point and partially because of the disasters of, of the last year. Uh, or three, uh, where I think that, you know, the audience for these kinds of stories and the participants in these kinds of conversations are more open now um, than perhaps, you know, in the recent past. Uh, the politicization is less, less than, it, than it used to be, and the, um, the real life impacts uh, on home and family and finances is, is becoming greater. Um, you know, but where we go from here, I think, is, a, is an enormous challenge. It's not uh, clear. My, you know, my reporting highlighted uh, enormous equity challenges, which we're all aware of in this conversation and, and talking about more. But, but of course, you know, the effects of, um, of each of these uh, environmental changes do not uh, strike Americans uh, equally, um, though they probably will impact uh, all strata of Americans, uh, but with different effects. And one of the most interesting things um, that I'm continuing to explore is this idea of, uh, of what resilience means, because, uh, you know, one of the things that becomes apparent through my reporting is that the very idea of resilience, as important as it is, is also sort of a suggestion of reverting to or preserving the status quo. And, you know, when you look at the equity issues that arise through, you know, climate's impact, one of the things that is clear um, is that the status quo isn't good enough. Um, that there's a lot of structural changes uh, across uh, culturally across the United States that relate to climate, but it relate to economics and relate to race that all need to begin to change. And so, you know, I, I guess, you know, as a launching point for the conversation, I think it's interesting to start thinking about how uh, a changing definition of resilience or what it is that we're aiming to preserve, you know, is, is, a, is all sort of part and parcel of this question of how we adapt um, to climate and what the country starts to look like as, you know, our population moves around, uh, around the country and around the world. I'll leave uh, it at that. Th that's fantastic. I really do want to return to definitions of words like resilience. Uh, and we're about to speak to uh, Abena, who's the first chief resilience officer for her city. But Michael Oppenheimer's recent article in Foreign Affairs says, yeah, we've got to do a lot of things, but the word adaptation really needs to enter our vocabulary. If you're talking about 160 million people impacted, Abram, clearly adaptation is hugely important. And uh, it, I hope it doesn't suggest resignation. I think it suggests proactive address to a situation that's, that's upon us. But uh, turning to Abena, um, uh, you're an engineer. You think about and have thought about infrastructure in the part of the world where you are now, but also uh, internationally and in New York. And, and like Nicole, you're dealing with real-time issues uh, in a city. And, and you, as you've described your city to me, you're a full service city. And I really appreciate that. I think solutions are going to come at the local level. So um, do you want to describe your situation in Tallahassee, Abna, and, and maybe even respond to a little what you heard, if that makes sense? Sure. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity as well. And um, Tallahassee has had its share of shocks as well, um, probably even more so when we began this journey of building resilience and, and thinking about strategizing and beginning to implement resilience um, efforts in our community. It's almost like a um, I don't know, once you say the words, then you start uh, being aware of perhaps all the challenges and, and you start to see disruption in a different way. Um, we've gotten into uh, a joke in, in our leadership team because somebody just has to say a word or, well, at least we didn't have a pandemic. And then here we are with a pandemic. And so we're also, I just before this call got off um, our emergency management uh, planning for cold night shelter because our temperatures have dipped below um, the threshold that uh, the, the health department 
uh, warns us that anybody that's unsheltered could could yeah. die overnight. And so we've activated emergency cold night shelters the last couple of days. So truly unprecedented times. And I think when we began our process um, with resilience planning several years ago, we were coming out of one of the first major hurricanes um, in several decades. But immediately when the conversation started, I think the community recognized that it's not just hurricanes that we uh, may not be prepared for, but a whole host of other issues. And before that plan was completed, we had an active shooter, we had a cold uh, spell, we had actual snow. I don't care what anybody says, Tallahassee had snow. It was about half an inch, maybe, sprinkles, but we it, it, it was disruptive enough for us. Um, and, and a host of other issues that have come up. And so um, luckily or unluckily, we've had a lot of practice over the last four years. And when the pandemic hit in March, it was amazing how quickly multiple departments, agencies sprung into action. We didn't do it perfectly by no means, but just the exercise of waking up, alerting, activating, um, thinking through multiple steps. Um, we've had a lot more practice leading up to this. Um, but to the points that were mentioned before, uh, and I love the way, um, Van, you said it about um, disasters being a punctuation mark to a sentence. That's absolutely true. Um, these moments of disaster really just wake up, uh, wake us up to what has already been happening. And so our dis discussion about resilience in Tallahassee has been this balance of um, the, the underlying stressors. And what does that tell us about our vulnerabilities? Who is vulnerable? How they are vulnerable? And why that might be much worse for them and for the whole community should something um, accentuate <laughs> you know, those vulnerabilities or a crisis happen. So um, our questions have been a focus on who is vulnerable. And that has shown us the way on how to begin to act. So when you think about a cold spell, um, it's, it's, and you ask the question, who is vulnerable? Well, it's somebody who is unsheltered, right? Or somebody who is sheltered um, in a, a poor uh, standard home, um, that somebody who can't afford utility um, bills, they might be tempted to not heat their homes properly. Um, so always asking that question helps us, I think, with a better answer. And when we address those vulnerable individuals first, I think we start to have solutions that serve the entire community uh, quite well. So your responsiveness to the individual is a direct reflection of Nicole saying it's about people. And I think both of your definitions of resilience, which were either given to you by organizations with whom you worked or uh, however you came into them have expanded, literally. Your, your title has changed recently to reflect housing in that. But before I go to the mayor, because he's gonna be able to respond to this, I'm sure. You are in one of the three state capitals that's in the 10X quarter. Uh, and you're in a state that not that long ago really couldn't talk about climate change as openly as I think you can today. The relationship, and you're right down the street from the capital, it being in Tallahassee, but the relationship between the local situation and the regional and or state situation and how you navigate that. How's that operate for you, uh, Abana? Yeah, it is very interesting. Tallahassee feels uh, big, but it's quite small. There are uh, multiple agencies from the federal level down to the local level. I would say we play relatively well, but at the city, as you mentioned, being a full service city, um, we can't help but get right to work with everyday issues on water, you know, stormwater. Uh, we run the airport, we run the mass transportation system. Um, we're it, we're the, the beginning and end for a lot of our residents. And so um, when we engage around these issues, we have a good, uh, a great laboratory to explore the solutions, but we also, you know, as they say, that this is where the rubber meets the road. And so when policies are being discussed at the state level across the street, we can quickly say, this is how it will translate to us and we can engage as needed, but practically speaking, we can't afford to wait for decisions to be made. Um, and so when um, there are national level discourse um, about whether or not we call something one thing or the other, I think at the local level, at the resident, at the neighborhood level, they want solution. They understand the problems. They don't care what you call it. <laughs> they want to see some actions. Um, and I think that's been the, the spirit of how the city has worked. Solutions focus not so much more on um, terminology. I don't think that's ever slowed us down. Um, and not so much about, you know, whether uh, one believes something to be true or not. 
Uh, we we've had the um the 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 reality is that there are issues today that we've had to respond to, and I think that has been enough motivation to get us working quickly. Great. So, Mayor Rio Regoso, uh, you've seen government at all levels. You've been the Speaker of the House in California. You're obviously, the mayor of the second largest city in the United States for a considerable length of time. Uh, head of the U.S. Council of Mayors, and I know you've had an eye on national politics in terms of how we need to move collectively forward. So as you think about the roles of government at various levels in the, the macro issue of climate change and the things that are being encountered, whether it's on the street or uh, on the continent, how do you think about these issues and, and optimal, if you want to think about it that way, role for government at various levels? Well, first of all, Duke, I want to thank you and Ten Across. It, uh... This is not my first uh, opportunity to participate in this effort. And when we first met a couple of years ago, I said to you that it, I thought it was very forward thinking of Arizona State to, to connect us because it does take a village. And um, the, the 10 uh, freeway highway is uh, kind of a metaphor for that. And um, it connects us from Tallahassee uh, to Los Angeles. Uh, as you said, the second largest city in the country the third largest metropolitan economy in the world behind Tokyo and New York. Uh, and we believe um, the capital of the Pacific Rim. And so uh, I was elected in 2005, if you recall, uh, and I, uh, until 2013, eight years. Um, and I was very fortunate. By the way, I always feel a little uncomfortable being with subject matter experts like all of you and very esteemed group of people. Um, I had some of those. Nancy Sutley went from uh, my deputy mayor to the White House Chair of Environmental Quality, has worked for Governor Brown and myself. Um, and Mary uh, Nichols uh, worked for, I believe, uh, four governors uh, and also for me uh, and has chaired virtually every uh, you know, commission uh, at the city uh, related to environment uh, and at the state. Uh, and Romel Pasquale, who was my deputy mayor and worked in the Clinton administration. Those were the experts. But uh, when I got elected, I said, we were gonna make LA the cleanest, greenest big city in the country. You remember before Paris, it was Copenhagen and Kyoto. And the United States of America had not signed on to either of those uh, agreements. And it really done very little uh, to uh, move the country ahead uh, on the issue of climate change. And so mayors got together and said, if the federal government is gonna do what it's done at Kyoto, what it did um, at, uh, in Copenhagen, uh, point fingers at all the other countries and refuse to take responsibility uh, for climate change, uh, we're gonna lead the way. So uh, Mayor Nichols out of Seattle led the effort. I think in January of 2005, I was elected in July. What we did is we signed on to the Kyoto Initiative, which as you know says, we'll reduce carbon emissions by 7% of 1990 levels by 2000, I believe 12. Uh, I signed on in July, a couple of weeks after getting elected. Um, I said in my inauguration, we make LA the cleanest, greenest big city in the country. For those of you who don't know LA, it's known as the city with the dirtiest air, the most, uh, it's addiction to the single pa passenger automobile, a city of sprawl, a city of very little transit. So when I said that, everybody rolled their eyes and said another politician talking. Um, we, at the time we had about, uh, we had the dirtiest public utility in the United States of America and the biggest. Uh, I said we'd uh, meet the Kyoto levels, we did. We reduced our carbon emissions, not by 7%, not 14, but 28% below uh, Kyoto levels by 2012. Uh, we six coupled, or if that's the word, um, uh, the uh, renewables from 3% uh, to 20% by 2012. I think they're only at 28% today, uh, what, uh, eight years later. Uh, we signed agreements to get LA completely off of coal by 2025. Uh, we uh, uh, passed a, a half -cent penny sales tax uh, that generated $40 billion over a 30 year period of time, built three light rail lines and one busway more than anyone uh, in the world, as I understand it, unless China did more, uh, we're not sure of that, but cut uh, air pollution by half uh, with cold ironing and other um, 
technologies, uh, the most far reaching effort to reduce carbon emissions at a port in the world. Um, we did the first feed in tariff program of any city in the United States. Uh, we synchronized all of our lights and we're a big city, uh, I think 456 square miles. So every traffic light was synchronized. Uh, we, uh, and put an LED, installed LED lights in all of them. Uh, we did the largest effort to 144,000 street lamps uh, installed from uh, incandescent lights to LED and the list goes on. I you know, did more parks than we had done in 12 years, doubled the number of parks that we had done it, uh, in the 12 years beforehand. Uh, I said we'd plant a million trees and by the way, uh, for those of you who work for politicians, uh, that's the one thing the press always focused on. Uh, we had something called the, the biggest recession since the 1930 uh, or 28, um, 29 uh, crash and during the, the, the depression. Uh, so we didn't have the resources we thought we were gonna have. Uh, we didn't do a million trees. We did 400,000, it was six times more than we had ever done before. In fact, the federal government called it the best urban forestry program in the country and so did California. And yet uh, we were just one of many cities. And while we certainly were among the top uh, all across the board on the issues I just raised, we were one of many cities that led the way. So by the time we got to Copenhagen, most of us uh, were really, you know, taking some of the spotlight from the federal leaders. Cause we said, hey, look, we're gonna stop pointing fingers. Uh, we're gonna stop making excuses. We're gonna do what we, need to do. By the way, on adaptation, uh, I did the most far-reaching adaptation plan. Remember, I was mayor way back when. Many people have done it since then, but um, uh, in our city with UCLA, um, uh, back I think in 2011 or 10, and uh, so we did all of this, but so did many other cities. They, they all, uh, you know, dug in deep and led the way. And so even though uh, today, although we had signed uh, the Paris Accord under the Obama administration, and now we have a climate denier uh, in the White House, soon we will have a partner at the federal level. And that's going to be important because as much as we've done, we need to do so much more. So uh, by the way, I was just about to ask you, that's a great segue. What are, because you, you are a, a, the best advertisement for the local address to these issues. I mean, it's just fantastic what you just went through. I'm sure Nicole and Abda and others are, are in agreement with that. What are your expectations uh, with uh, Senator Kerry as uh, uh, an ambassador or uh, an envoy with regard to climate? How, what do you, th well, how do you think, I'm, what will that mean for I'm, LA and for Senator California? Kerry, I co-chaired his campaign in 2003. Uh, I chaired the platform committee and as you know, later uh, chaired the Democratic Convention for Obama. And I can tell you this, uh, he was, there front and center, uh, helping to negotiate and lead the way, lead the, uh, on the Paris Accord. I think he's a great pick uh, here uh, to get us back in the accord. Uh, I think to work uh, with the federal government and marshal the resources of the various departments uh, to really move us uh, and accelerate, uh, you know, our efforts to make up for, you know, four lost years. And that's what we had. You know, the other thing we did, because, you know, actually this all started before I got elected in 2005. Uh, remember, I was Speaker of the Assembly and an Assembly member. And back then, the Democrats were trying to get a, rid of the air quality, well, if not get rid of, uh, reduce the jurisdiction and lessen the powers of the Air Quality Management District. And I took them on, uh, my own party. Uh, they were joining the Republicans, by the way. And, and I took them on and, and, and took on this issue of jobs blackmail. What you've seen in the campaign on, you know, on the issue of, uh, you know, moving uh, away from uh, focus on carbon, you know, uh, on carbon sources of power and coal is that they say, well, we're going to lose all these jobs. So one of the things I did early on is we worked with our unions, but also with community organizations. Uh, to develop apprenticeship programs, uh, to develop community-driven efforts, uh, to retrain people, reskill people for these new jobs. That's critical. 
because the pushback from the conservatives and the pushback from the climate deniers is you're going to, you know, kill jobs. You're going to hurt the economy. Actually, it's the opposite. We right. can grow the economy with these new technologies, but they're right. right about something. You can't just throw these people out of jobs. And sometimes I think the Democrats aren't, you know, aren't clear enough about explaining how we can retrain these very same people in good paying union jobs to do the work of the future, whether it's installing, um, you know, uh, solar or any of the, 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 you know, uh, installing LED lights, uh, all of those things. And so I think with a federal government that's focused now, you know, I pray that we win the Senate because Without the Senate, we're going to have, you know, I think if anybody who's reading who's, or who's understood the right. level of partisanship on the other side, uh, although, um, you know, by, uh, President-elect Biden and I share this notion that we got to work with them as much as we can. Right. Uh, after Trump won, I said that we have to work with him where we can. But it, it's clear that there's going to be a lot of resistance. And so winning the, you know, the two seats are going to be important. But even okay, if we, Mayor, I'm, I'm with you, and I, I agree. I don't mean to interrupt, and I don't mean to be sure. rude. I want to make sure I weave our, our other colleagues in here a little bit. Is that all right? Absolutely. So I'm, I'm totally with you. Uh, so I'm sure some of you may have uh, uh, something you heard that, that, that the mayor just vocalized that you may want to respond to. If not, I have a thought uh, in that a couple of the items that came before what the mayor was describing, and he is describing, by the way, an immigrant city, a place where a lot of people have migrated to from all over the world. Um, the, the words displacement show up in, in Van's work and clearly in Abram's writing. And I know uh, uh, Abana and, and Nicole, you're dealing with matters of displacement, whether it's across the border in El Paso or, or downtown. And, and the mayor had these issues and they're still there in LA. And, and it's something we all need to overcome. How does the word displacement serve as a registration for these big issues and, and the role of government in, in addressing displacement at all levels? Um, I don't know who would like to take that on. I mean, Nicole, we haven't heard from you for a minute. Do you, you want to talk about displacement? Because being right there on the border, you you see displacement every day. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, um, I mean, you have displacement that occurs uh, obviously locally within our community. Um, when we start to talk about trying to address uh, affordable housing issues, utility costs burden, it, it starts to become a, it, an issue that surrounds poverty and opportunity. Um, when we're looking at it locally. But I think more broadly, and, and uh, I, I look back to Abraham's work and, and he looked into, you know, the role, the, the sort of node that El Paso uh, functions as in terms of the migratory patterns of a lot of different folks. And so when we start to talk about displacement in terms of where people are coming from and moving to, El Paso really becomes a, a, a crossing point, right? You know, um, for those of y'all that don't know our history, um, uh, we were originally referred to as El Paso del Norte, right? So the Pass of the North. Um, and we still largely to this day function in that capacity. You see folks that are coming up from South America, they're coming through Ciudad Juarez into El Paso, but largely they're not staying here. Largely they're continuing to move on to other areas across uh, uh, the United States predominantly. Uh, lots of times Los Angeles, sometimes Houston, um, sometimes New Orleans, I mean, they're moving uh, to lots of different places. And so a lot of times what we're grappling with in terms of that kind of displacement in our community is how do we sort of um, provide that sort of humanitarian um, checkpoint for folks? How do we put our arms around uh, migrants that are moving along but are really in desperate need of, uh, of varying levels of support as they get here? As you know, in 2018, uh, it was Christmas 2018, so actually uh, uh, two years ago uh, this holiday, Christmas Eve, uh, we were experiencing somewhere in the range of 500 to 1,000 migrants a day coming into our community. That was when we had that big surge. And on Christmas Eve, the city of El Paso really had to catalyze our own resources to be able to protect those folks, not because um, we you know, uh, there was a federal mandate to do so. Actually, it was quite the opposite. We didn't have any resources to do that. So we had to come together as a community. But what we realized is that we didn't have the structure to do that. So since that time, Duke, I, I will say, we've learned a lot in terms of what, what systems, structures, services, and processes can we put in place that work for us every day with that local displacement that I mentioned, right? right. 
um, that also prepare us for that surge capacity that we have to absorb. And I will tell you that's happening now due to COVID. We have more and more folks that are displaced for a variety of reasons. And I will say um, without going too far because we're, we're just starting to see this now, um, we're starting to see um, folks coming into El Paso uh, uh, um, legally and illegally uh, to access resources, testing resources, shelter resources, safe space resources, because they're not getting what they need in other places. And so that's something we grapple with on a, on a regular basis. So, so, so that, that migration uh, is a result of a lot of difficult things in countries to the Southwest and, and for a variety of social and economic uh, issues. Abram, you've described uh, in some ways, you haven't seen anything yet until you see climate induced migration and people are forced to move north or to a place where they can not only find jobs, but literally they can work because it's not too hot. And some of you are writing, you've described the inability of some economies to function at a certain heat level. Do, do you think what Nicole's dealing with now will uh, be clearly exacerbated in the future? And, and how quickly do you think we might experience something like that? Yeah, I mean, the short answer is yes. Um, you know, it's uh, 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 there's some specific answers to your questions. I mean, we, we modeled for the, the reporting that I did about change in the United States, we intentionally modeled out to 2040 uh, to keep it in a very near term time frame. So we're looking at substantial changes that we will begin to, we are experiencing now uh, and that will intensify over the next you know, 15 years, 30, 20 years. Um, the, uh, you know, the economic impact, even for the United States of, of what we're going to see are the ability of people to work in heat, for example, uh, you know, some of the researchers that work with the Rhodium Group, a, a climate data firm here in the Bay Area, um, you know, they project economic decline ranging from around eight or 9% for cities of, of uh, or slowing in GDP growth, I should say, of eight or 9% for cities like El Paso to, you know, as much as 50% for, for some places, some counties in Florida. So um, that's for a lot of reasons, but I mean, heat makes it more difficult to work. It makes it more difficult to grow food. It makes it more difficult to get along with your spouses. I mean, it's a, it has wide ranging cultural impact. Um, the, some of the research that I'm reading right now puts an optimum temperature range for human productivity. There's a little bit of a wonky thing, but it, it's at like 55 or 60 degrees. And what you see is that um, really only the northern half of American cities have an average temperature in that range. And so the southern half are already, you know, kind of on the boundary, uh, you know, of what's workable in that sense, uh, and, and are going to be moving, you know, out of that work further out of that workability range. So um, yeah, I mean, I think these these problems are going to intensify that international pressure, uh, and and it's going to be coupled with really, you know, substantial changes um, in in the U.S. as well. I mean, do, do, if I can just cap off with you know a quick thought, going back to this idea of displacement, because it gets at this. I mean, displacement is you know by definition an involuntary uh, action, and I think that's what's really you know defining about you know sort of this climate movement at the moment is. Um, that you know, cities, states, they build economies, they, they plan for attracting people, for building voluntary growth, voluntary participation in new economies, et cetera. But we're moving into a stage where um, individuals are going to begin to grapple with the fact that they can't fully make the, their ideal decisions about their own life paths are going to be steered by external changes like environmental changes. Um, and, and communities that have to grow and respond to that are going to begin to need to incorporate um, uh, if you, you know, refugees is a severe term that applies to some of these people, but there's a much more subtler gray range of uh, people who will be, you know, pushed uh, to relocate or pushed out of, you know, places they'd prefer to be involuntarily. And I, you know, I think that's really, you know, sort of ringing the bell on a new era of, of the kind of change we're going to see. Duke, if, so you this don't is mind, if you don't mind, Duke, I just, I just really quickly, Aram, I, I just want to put an exclamation mark on what you kind of just said about displacement being involuntary, because I do think that what you see in a lot of cities, and, and we're guilty of it as well, is you, you start talking about economic development and we start to talk about quality of life and investment. And a lot of that is because we're trying to attract folks, but we do have, you know, you have that sort of migratory pattern through our community. How are we embracing that? Like, how are we looking at that a little differently and start instead of kind of approaching it with the same cookie cutter sort of model that we've seen for many, many years. And then the last thing I will say, just to lighten the mood a tiny bit, is uh, the desert rat in the room will say that 55 degrees is cold Yes. Uh, and if it's not 80 degrees, 
Farini's not happy. So I'm just. I, I, I was about to say, uh, <laughs> Phoenix and Van, I want to get right to you, but Phoenix went from about 30 plus 110 degree days a year to over 50 this year. And that kind of leap is wildly abnormal. But linking the idea of displacement and, and as, as Abram just put it, forced, and a, but the predictability of being forced, if you will, which is sort of uh, uh, an oxymoron, I understand that. If, if you know New Orleans like Van and I do, what happened to Katrina was predicted and predictable. Uh, and, and so people were forced to move, but if you looked and the engineer in Abada would say, yeah, look at those levee walls, other things. How do we see the potential for something to happen that's gonna cause displacement and do something before that happens? Or maybe not live in certain areas that are gonna make us susceptible to those kind of things. Van, how, how do you perceive a place like New Orleans? Because you talked about it, uh, even post Katrina, people saying maybe we should just let that place go. Maybe it's just too difficult. We shouldn't have been there in the first place. Well, and these are difficult questions. And I think uh, one thing that I try to do uh, in my work is to take a lot of these uh, terms and ideas like displacement um, and movement and migration and take them from the theoretical to really thinking about how they are affecting decisions that families, individual families are going to have to make. Uh, what does displacement mean? What does a forced migration mean when it means leaving a place that your family has called home for hundreds of years? What does it mean, you know, when you live on a street that has your last name as the street name? Um, these are, you know, that's a whole different, uh, I think, ball game. And it's not just people deciding to pack up and leave. It's people making you know real historical decisions to cleave themselves from a place that has sustained them and oftentimes for people of color um, has been a place where they found a safe haven and you know the history of migration for people on the margins in America you don't know if you're going to find another haven going to another place um, and, and that's a, a key consideration you know, I think it was really important with looking at people after Katrina uh, in New Orleans and the Gulf Coast, uh, how they uh, really pushed back against the phrase refugee uh, because that phrase to them and to lots of people um, sort of meant that their placement or their being accepted into new communities was purely on the basis of charity. And that what happened to them was uh, not the responsibility by law of other Americans. And I think uh, people are actually having that conversation now with the term climate refugee too. Right. Um, people in America are saying, wait a minute, if I'm being displaced by sea level rise that is being you know, sort of pushed along by American corporations, why would that make me a refugee? Wouldn't it make me a person with a legal claim to safe haven somewhere else in America? Um, I think we're seeing people have those conversations now and they are influenced by these major disaster events like Katrina, like the major migration of people from the island of Puerto Rico after Maria, uh, but also they're being influenced by the slower uh, attrition of people from uh, hot, from environmentally marginal areas to more attractive areas. Um, and again, you know, they are conversations about what home means, about uh, what it means to leave a place, uh, what it means to leave a place where you have security. Um, and go to a place where you're not guaranteed that kind of cultural, economic, or uh, social stability. And uh, those are things that we have not really done well as a country of uh, putting together in any type of you know, coherent national strategy. Uh, it really, you know, we're talking about government. I think we've left places, uh, left cities, left towns and counties on their own for the most part. Uh, and, and that's one thing I think we really need to uh, pivot towards in this climate century. In, in the 15 minutes we have with the group, uh, and Van, just to follow up on exactly that point, if you're in Louisiana and in New, the New Orleans area where, you, where you've written about, you've got that immediate disruptive need to move when the hurricane comes and frankly, government failed a lot of people, the buses didn't show, all kinds of things. But you've got that slow moving tide, which I think you were also suggesting maybe based on what corporations have done to the bayou and remove some of the barriers that would preserve the wetlands. And people have been literally forced off the land because it's now underwater. How, how has your perception of government changed with regard to viewing all these stories at such a personal level? What do you think about it at this moment? 
No, so I, I think that our current model of problem solving is simply not built for all of the different challenges that we're going to face in a warming world. Um, and that's on the disaster level. That's thinking about our uh, response to really acute, sudden uh, things like hurricanes, like big floods. Um, you know, we, we still rely on a, essentially a Jeffersonian federalist model of, uh, you know, uh, trying to, uh, it, it's very slow. Uh, people generally have to petition on a, on a state, local, and even family level for the resources they need. Um, and they have to have the wherewithal to be able to, to figure out what they need. Um, you know, a lot of it's still based in insurance. Um, and, and that doesn't really work in a, in a world where, uh, again, you know, 60, 70, 80 million Americans are going to have to move imminently because of climate pressures. So, so uh, I, I want to go to Adma because she was taking me to task a little bit. I said something about government before we really got on, and I wasn't talking about her government. But, but based on what you just heard Dan say, and again, you, you know, for all intents and purposes, you are government right now. You are trying to help. Based on what Dan's saying and some of the inadequacies, do you have enough tools in your toolbox? And what do you really miss? What did you wish you, you, you had in your office? Or how might you think about your role and how you could be more effective if you could? How would you describe that? Yeah, uh, at the risk of speaking for all governments everywhere, um, <laughs> I, I love local government because I think they're, they're, I know they're closest to people. And I know that our decisions um, are, are careful and well thought out because we go to grocery stores and schools with our constituents. So, you know, what we need um, as we balance international and national best practices um, with our unique local context is the resources and space. Give me all the money and then give me the space to implement, um, you know, whoever's listening, because I think that there's a lot of uh, creativity and innovation at the local level. Um, and with adequate resources, we can make it work. I think local re uh, en entities have also learned to be creative because there hasn't always been um, federal and state level resources. I mean, on the housing aspect, for example, you know, our like, local funding sources usually get um, swept. And this was the first year that it's not swept, but it's on hold mm -hmm. while we deal with uh, COVID. Um, so it's yet another reminder that, you know, if we are serious, if we care, and if we want to put the resources there, we can. And when we do, I do think you'll find that a lot of local agencies are ready to spring into actions because one thing we'd love to do is develop plans and strategies. We have metrics in place and not enough funding to actually uh, do the work. But I do think to, to, chime in on the previous commentary, you know, migration and movement has been part of the human history. It's not going to change. And I think that we need to kind of understand that this is a way that we have as a as people um, evolved. We move by choice or by force. Um, we move for better or for worse, and we should expect it. Um, and I think sometimes these disasters are good reminders and good motivators for movement. But I think in the early part of this conversation, when we start talking about adaptation and why that's a good thing is, you know, you can move or you can adapt. And there are good models too of people that have stayed and adapted. And we can learn from indigenous groups. We can learn from, um, you know, smaller communities that have learned to live well in their environment and to live lightly on the earth. Those lessons are so important now, even as we get so advanced and technical that we forget there are ways to do this in a more balanced way. Um, but not to uh, fight the, the, what the land is telling us that we need to do. Um, a lot of the, the limited work that I did in New Orleans was looking at that as well. What, what is the land telling us is our capacity. Um, so if we are gonna stay here, we have to adapt. And the same work in Nigeria, where um, the community I was working in was dealing with flooding. They've been there for centuries. Um, so the question isn't so much, uh, should we leave? It's how must we live here? Um, and that, that could be an acceptable response as well um, versus fleeing, versus um, moving to a new place, because that will also have its challenges. One of our conversations on resilience has been not just um, getting away from it or avoiding the worst, it's looking squarely in the face of disaster and saying this will happen. And when it happens, how will we, how will we have capacity to deal with it? 
You know, what will we do to respond and then thrive eventually? And, and some of that response includes taking better action so that those disasters aren't as horrible as they could be. But it also includes dealing with the reality that disasters and crisis and shocks are a natural part of our lives um, as an individual at a household level, certainly as the city and the national level. So we're gonna, we've got uh, a little less than 10 minutes and I know the mayor has an important appointment. So I'm gonna go to him shortly. We have one question, which I'm not sure anybody has an answer to, but it's an interesting thing relative to local situations. And, and the questioner asked that. He's interested in his day uh, about a carbon fee and dividend, and it would happen at the state level, presumably, and what would be the local impact? Uh, does anybody have a short, sweet, crisp answer to that uh, and our strong feelings about it? I'm looking to the audience here. Now, if you don't, it's okay, because we'll save that, because it might take us on another track. So um, in, in the as we close this down, I'm gonna turn to the mayor first and then come back to each of you. It's something I raised at the beginning. This is a, a, a uniquely composed panel where you've got, again, people like Van and Abram who are sitting back and collecting data and narratives and all kinds of things and reporting back what they're finding to us. And, and I wanna understand for those of you who are in government, the, how you read those things. If I'm, if I'm reading Abram's article and I'm looking at, if I'm the mayor uh, and a California citizen, I'm looking at my, my state on fire here. Uh, What's my response to that? Am I glad that someone is telling it like it is, as he sees it? Or does it uh, maybe, uh, not to use too much for fun, sort of inflame tensions about, oh, climate change, everything is going to triple with climate change. How are those of you who are reporting and writing helping those who are in government? And how are those in government use these things or maybe say, yeah, that was great to read, but I've got to keep my head down and get my job done. So, Mr. Mayor, how do you how do you take big picture issues like climate change, uh, the way they're presented by these authors, and work them into your work? Well, that's why it's great to be uh, on a panel with subject matter experts like the folks on this uh, panel. Uh, I, I embrace it. You know, when I read something that that we should be doing that we're not, uh, you know, a crisis that is coming down uh, the road uh, or the highway, the ten highway, no pun intended. Um, obviously, um, you know, I, instead of, you know, getting upset that we may not have focused on that, I bring the best and the brightest and say, let's put a plan together. Let's figure out how we do this. And something that Van said that I think is really important because my criticism sometimes of the environmental movement is that they don't focus enough on environmental justice. Uh, mm -hmm. they focus a lot. You know, as an example, you know, Volkswagen, uh, you know, basically says uh, their cars are doing X and they were really doing Y and they, you know, the state of California forced them um, to pay a lot of money to the state. And the first thing they did was uh, do, uh, you know, um, what's it called? Charging stations for electric cars. Well, not everybody has an electric car, particularly poor people. Uh, I have a hybrid. Uh, so it benefited me, but it didn't benefit the people that are always left behind. So uh, I focused a lot on equity. Virtually everything I did, I had a layer across about the issue of equity, whether it was parks. I put them mostly in park poor areas, whether it was transit. I put it in the areas where uh, the experts said the transit dependent were, you know, an islands onto themselves. And so, I, you know, a focus on the, the poor and on the, the implications of environmental justice, I think is very, very important. And I'm hoping this current administration really understands that, but mm -hmm. I embrace it. You know, I say, look, let's get together and, and let's do this and put a plan. It is the reason that we selected the geography from 10 across. So much of what you just described is very present here, whether it's because of industry or longstanding uh, socioeconomic circumstances. If you want to see the future of the country, we think it's here and environmental justice is a huge part of it. Mr. Mayor, I know you need to run to your next appointment. Uh, it was we were delighted to have you here. We'll finish up for the rest of us uh, if you need to run. And uh, we're going to close here in just a few minutes. And, and if you could share the contact information of the other uh, speakers, that would be great. Thank you. all. And, and as I said to all of you before, I and think I, this is not our last meeting. I think we're going to get back together. We have too much else we want to cover. But in the Good. closing minutes for everybody, uh, maybe, uh, Nicole, you haven't gotten a few words in lately. 
tell me again how you take uh, major observations by our, our esteemed authors here and how you absorb it into your work. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think, Duke, you're getting uh, accustomed to reading my body language. Start to do that. <laughs> I have something to say. So I want to take a couple of steps back. Um, okay. Resilience is absolutely not about maintaining the status quo. I just want to challenge that notion. Resilience is not emergency management. Okay. Uh, and I think that well, the point that I want to bring up and, and kind of to answer your question and, and some of the takeaways from this conversation is to bring to light this tension that exists between emergency response, emergency management, and what we do as resilience practitioners and community developers, right? Because I consider myself probably a community developer first, right? Yeah. Really looking at what impacts people in the long run. I said it in my opening comments, you know, if we're looking at, you know, creating whatever the next hashtag is in terms of solutions to the latest crisis, that is the only space we're ever going to live in. Um, I do think it's relevant to say that the crisis is the punctuation, right? But it's important to understand the rest of the sentence and not just what's past, but what's coming, yeah. right? And I think yeah. that when we talk about resilience, it's important to start to 360 think, start to understand that an investment in emergency response cannot just do that one thing. You cannot just deal with, you know, pulling back the floodwaters, right? You have to deal with what's left behind and make sure that it's increasingly stronger for the future. And I'm gonna use a very um, uh, recent example is um, the CARES Act that was deployed to address COVID-19 across this entire country. Um, I, Duke, I won't take all the time, but I will tell you, if you want to, I could have a three hour session um, with cocktails about what worked about the CARES Act. And I know what it was intended to do, but it did not. Well, Nicole, we neither have cocktails or three hours, but I do want to come back to you on that because I know, I know you have a lot to say and you say it so well on behalf of your community. I just want to quickly go back to something that was said earlier. What do cities need? Yep. We need flexibility. We understand our communities better than anybody else. And if I'm right. going to talk about legislation and I'm going to talk about stimulus and I'm going to talk about what comes down to cities, stop trying to micromanage us from on high. Exactly. I, I think the, the, the lesson is the federal government would do so well to listen and observe what you're doing. Uh, and I'm sure Abana would second that. Do you, you want to put in a very short last word, Abana? I just, you know, the poet snap to that. Flexibility has been uh, proven to be the, the way we can innovate and we can be nimble um, when we have less restrictions. And we're, we've learned that very clearly with the CARES Act. Um, I, I echo the sentiments about focusing on who's most vulnerable, uh, that those solutions for them actually are better for the whole community as a whole. Um, so I, I, it's my pleasure to be here. I thank you for the opportunity. And I've learned a lot from the rest of uh, you all as well. Thank you for the work you're doing. I embrace it. I take right. your writing. Um, I, I, I read it well. In fact, I got a couple just today. Um, but what, has, what it has meant for us is that a focus on data for our local needs. So when I hear the national rhetoric, I can say, this is interesting. I wonder what it's like on our local level. And we've been motivated to seek that data and then contextualize it for ourselves. And we're doing exactly that actually next week on housing uh, instability in light of COVID because we hear the national conversation on evictions and foreclosure. And our leadership is asking us, well, what does that look like for Tallahassee? And we go out and we seek those answers. So it's instructive, it's helpful to have the clarion call, we appreciate it. Um, but we know the hard work is still looking at what is local for us right. and you guys inspire that. So and thank and you. I, th I think the motivation for Ten Across is the fact that with data, as well as the stories that people like Van collect in the field, uh, we have no excuse for not acting. We can see the future, maybe more brilliantly than any society's ever been able to do. Therefore, what will we do with that information? Uh, Brad, do you want to add anything to that, given that the predictive nature of the work that you've done with all of that data and how we should be responding in, the, in 30 seconds? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just go back to uh, this idea of turning point and, and response to the kind of articles. And I think that people are beginning to see that less as, you know, hyperbole and don't care as much what we call these problems or politicize them as much as realizing that they're actually happening and that they're happening to them and in their communities, regardless of, of where they you know, are on the political or economic spectrum. So if you're a farmer and you're losing crops, you're uh, you know, a Californian and you face fire threat. And that realization is opening minds, I think to, you know, for maybe for the first time or maybe you know, reaching sort of a critical momentum where 
um, there's possibility to do the kinds of things that uh, Nicole and Avina are talking about to drive uh, policy on a local level or on a national level that's actually responsive and that's substantive. Um, and we can start to move away from the, the rhetoric. And that's actually been the response that I've gotten um, you know, to my stories, surprisingly uh, a diverse and, and much more personal um, response than much of you know, what I end up writing about climate. And I see a sort of depolitization of, of that. And I think that's good. Great. So uh, I, told, I was told to turn the lights out on us like in, in one minute. So, so if you want to hear more from Van, you've got to go uh, listen to his podcast, Podbox. And so you'll get another four hours of Van. And it's an extraordinary tale of not only what happened there to families, but the role of government, the geography, some incredible personalities. And it's phenomenally well done. So, so Van, I want to thank you for that. And uh, I think I hear your kids in the background. The way you've managed this is brilliant. So thank you for all of you for being with us. I was also asked to say, because it's important, uh, that for future tense, the next event is next Tuesday on December 8th at 1230. And the topic is, is your university designed to create a better future? The answer to that is yes, because the president of my university will be speaking. So yes, we are designed to create a better future. Uh, so I hope all of you can attend that. And to the, the four of you who remain, and the mayor as well, uh, you're good friends. You have so much to say. You're doing phenomenal work. And I do hope we get together again in some format to follow up on some of the things we've just barely begun to scratch the surface of. So thank you very much. And I uh, look forward to that time when we see each other again.